I this done. Okay. Hi everybody. Um, so I'm here today talking to Brian Cook. Brian's a founder and uh, managing director of Cook Capital. Uh, very shortly, Cook Capital is a micro venture firm up in Queensland. Um, probably towards the angel investment end of town. Pretty pretty exciting stuff for getting ideas off the ground. Um, they invest, I would say, largely in um, entrepreneurs and opportunities. Um, Brian actually pretty interestingly has some good thoughts or some deep and well-developed thoughts on hardware and how to invest around it and whether that's a good idea and how that fits in the grand scheme of things. So I think it makes sense now for me to back off on that uh, Brian told us a bit about himself, what the company does, what they like to invest in, what they're thinking. Sure. Thanks, Nathan. And uh, thanks uh, for listening in, whoever is in the audience. But uh, I suppose uh, Cook Capital is uh, a micro VC fund, uh, as you said, towards the seed stage, you know, uh, smaller check sizes, essentially operating in a in an area where uh, up to now, primarily uh, angel investors and uh, family offices have uh, dominated. Uh, and what we've seen, I suppose, in Australia over the last few years is most of the VC uh, funds, while they're, doing a, while they're doing a fantastic job, are generally exiting this stage of the uh, startup ecosystem. Uh, the investment check size is just too small for them. so. We're generally targeting uh, capital rises and supporting entrepreneurs who are looking for one million or less uh, to get that initial idea off the ground. And uh, that's our kind of sweet spot. Uh, we may not uh, uh, fund the full one million, but we'll certainly uh, participate along with uh, others who might be uh, participating in that uh, startup's uh, initial capital rise. My background, uh, worked in a, a number of corporates, uh, also uh, launched uh, a startup myself. So I've got startup uh, founder experience and uh, listed that on the stock exchange back in uh, 2006, 2007. Exited uh, up until uh, recently, 2016, was a partner in PwC's consulting practice. And in 2016, founded Cook Capital, and uh, now I, uh, uh, I suppose, concentrate on early stage investing and corporate advisory for uh, in the M&A space. So that's me. Yeah, cool. So just um, kind of briefly, if you so some someone has an interesting idea for an early stage thing, what are the kind of red lights, green lights? What's what's the first kind of keywords in the first sentence or two that really catch your ear? I had a I had a conversation actually last week, uh, and one of the kind of questions: Am I talking to an inventor or am I talking to an entrepreneur? And uh, uh, we would have all seen it uh, very uh, tech savvy, but I had a conversation where we talked about the problem and the solution. And never talked about uh, customers, mm. or go to market strategy, or revenues, or cost of acquisition. So I'm always, uh, I'm always looking for uh, well balanced people. Of course, they need to have the technical skills and capability and knowledge to be able to, I suppose, produce the product and bring it to market. Uh, but you can't just be an evangelist for your own technological idea. Uh, no matter how passionate or uh, I suppose supportive of you, you are of uh, bringing that idea to fruition. Uh, you have to marry those technical skills with business skills to become what I call a technical entrepreneur as opposed to just an entrepreneur. I've equally seen on the other side people with good ideas but no technical skills uh, to bring their idea to fruition. Uh, and so you need that kind of balance uh, but you uh, you just cannot get caught up on your own idea, your own technical brilliance or the brilliance of the product that you invented. Uh, it's, it, it 
the the road is littered with failures it's also littered with some successes you know but uh I, i'm on the lookout for that balance i think that's a great point i think it's a point worth echoing so the, the perpetual balance between a good idea or talking about something that would be good to do and doing something that would be good to do so it, it is cool to have a good idea and it's cool to make something amazing but if no one uses it and it never goes anywhere that's one can buy it or adopt it yeah and probably uh uh you know you you hear a lot of hype about we invest in founders uh or we invest in new technology i i'd i'd, I'd simplify the whole matter uh and especially for i i suppose any of your uh listeners or viewers who are looking to raise capital uh i invest in businesses so it has to has to be a business and uh, that barking is my dog in the background <laughs> obviously chasing cats or possums but uh going back to the uh, the point at hand uh, what we're seeking is to invest in the business that's early stage that has a significant opportunity to scale and grow rapidly uh, and there some of the characteristics we're looking for thank you inadvertently hit a key point there cuz i spent too much of my life being an engineer and not understanding what people want in best in the solution because the solution is often but yeah this point what you said invest in invest in business well, yeah technology so it, it is fun to make some amazing solution and the lesson is it's not matter that the guy is not okay Okay, so how would you rate robotics or hardware intensive activities as an investment proposition? What kind of things would you be thinking about? I, I think, you know, there's a lot of debate about hardware versus software. And, you know, uh, uh, obviously one can't work without the other. Uh, the vast majority of my investments would sit on the software end of the spectrum uh, that is not to say i haven't invested in what could be classically deemed hardware the the issue with uh robotics and hardware startups is they don't have the scale advantages of software so uh, if they scale uh then they inherently through their business model have a higher cost base production manufacturing raw materials associated with that process people so if a if a tech hardware company scales its uh, cost base scales proportionally whereas uh software and mark andresen's comment about software eating the world is essentially uh the marginal cost of a piece of software scales to zero and as you're adding more units of sale in a saas business or a software business uh the profit margin is increasing proportionally now it doesn't it doesn't go to infinity uh but inherently uh the profitability of software companies are uh, and their scalability is more advantageous than robotics and uh hardware uh but that doesn't mean uh great hardware companies can't attract capital i mean we've got a brilliant example here in uh brisbane with uh, tridium uh the uh electric vehicle fast charging uh technology which is uh primarily uh hardware and has been extremely successful and uh, growing throughout the globe uh here in brisbane uh we've and i'm an investor in uh, verton uh which is uh technology related to uh, uh gyroscopic balancing of cranes in the construction sector mm. so when when the product and the market and the fit and the uniqueness and the differentiation is there uh then uh hardware companies can be very profitable 
uh, but I find them fewer and harder to find than uh, opportunities to invest in software. Do you think there'd be a, a business model aspect in, in there as well? So revenue? Right? Yeah, yeah, you know, it has to have, I, I mean, uh, there's not much of a, a market for a better mousetrap, is there? You know, uh, and uh, they have to be unique. Uh, they have to be a, a differentiated. Uh, they have to have a degree of differentiation of their business model. And, and so, uh, you know, there are examples out there. I'm thinking the recent uh, small scale IPO of uh, uh, the headphone company out of uh, Brisbane, Odera. Uh, now, James uh, Felding is the CEO of that company and uh, uh, built a brilliant product, high-end uh, headphones, but pivoted his business model away from consumers uh, to uh, health, uh, so people with hearing difficulties. So it was a combination of a brilliant piece of hardware uh, with some differentiation and advantages and a differentiated business model to focus away from consumers so that he didn't have to compete with Beats and Sennheiser and Bose and all the high-end uh, uh, models and focus on, uh, I suppose, the health sector helping uh, people with hearing difficulties. Yeah, uh, cool. A very smart example of uh, uh, both technology, uh, hardware, and uh, a very smart business mind to pivot to a, a, an underserved uh, part of the market. Yeah, I think that's really cool. And I, th I think that's probably a good example of something that um, a lot of maybe engineer-led companies struggle with. So we, we tend to have issues with separating the, tech, the technology with the application or the, the yeah. way we use the solution with the thing we actually made, which means pivots aren't natural because, you know, if we made a mining robot, w w w it doesn't work in airports. What are you talking about? It's for mining or we made yeah. tumor headphones. It's not the same thing, but really yeah, take that half a step back, we're back to the core tech, right? I mean, if, uh, if any of your readers are interested, it's been well documented in, uh, the Finn review, the story of Adira and, uh, the pivot away from while the company had significantly uh, uh, good t technology, good hardware, uh, it just couldn't uh, compete with the brands that are Beats and Bose and, uh, you know, uh, the companies that dominated uh, consumer channels and dominated uh, uh, marketing with their uh, budgets. So uh, a pivot into a sector which is extremely lucrative uh, is an option and that's what uh james and the team at adira did yeah so hopefully uh we wish them the best of success as they uh, grow over the next few years i think it should be okay i, I think the the world or even our world's heavily littered with that another uh startups hard to call them that now because they're a huge company in sydney pretty much the same story they made a bit of technology had a lot of competitors and a lot of them a lot you know, maybe more developed Paired it back to what the core asset was, changed, tack a little bit, and all of a sudden they exploded. Yeah, so. yeah. So, I mean, uh, and sometimes you might think the technology has an application in a certain sector, uh, but with different discussions and different uh, thinking, uh, that uh, technology can be applied in uh, in uh, multiple arenas. Yeah. It's actually, you've kind of got my mind racing. That's actually one of the reasons why I suggest to so many people to, to get involved with VCs, take some VC funding, that exposure to sectors or markets or possibilities that you just otherwise wouldn't bump into is invaluable. Yeah, and the trouble, especially for, uh, I suppose, a, a hardware uh, dominant company is, uh, you know, uh, most of the the companies will struggle to bring the product to minimal viable status. Now, to get your software to minimal viable status is way cheaper than getting your hardware uh, product to minimal viable status. And so that's, uh, and in general, in general, uh, 
most of the VCs won't want to uh, touch a startup unless uh, there's a demonstrable product, preferably with some early stage revenue or early stage customers. Yeah, not impossible. I, I think of stories like um, Microsoft, and I'm not so sure Windows 10 was an MVP yet, um, but still, they've built quite a big company selling quite a lot of versions. Yeah. That, and I don't think you would survive if, if you know, Windows 3.11 or even Windows 98 was a hardware product, the company sinks. Yeah, and that's, you know, when we go back to the discussion on uh, scalability, to be able to scale uh, a software company these days to minimal viable product uh, can be done with uh, a, a small team of people in the garage. Um, to scale a, a hardware company uh, is a lot more expensive. Prototyping, 3D printing helps to get uh, uh, things off the, off the ground. Yeah. Uh, but in general, uh, the cost to scale a hardware company to MVP versus the cost to scale uh, a software company uh, to MVP is much higher yeah. in so general. Well, so what I'm kind of hearing from you is it's not impossible, but it's much harder in hardware. Yes, in, in general. Uh, and this scalability that I talk about on one side is cost, time and speed. Uh, but on the other side, let's say we've got over that traction gap and that the product is in existence. Generally, uh, and all we, we have to do is look at uh, a subset of the ASX or the NASDAQ or right. uh, New York Stock Exchange and classify what I call manufacturing companies versus software companies and just look at the return on capital, uh, the, the EBITDA margins and the exit multiples. So it's, it's far more profitable to, uh, to invest in software. And yeah. that's not an opinion. Uh, I mean, we can... I like to say to people, you know, we, we can debate opinion, but we can't debate the facts. Uh, the fact of the matter is uh, uh, manufacturing versus software as a, a sector is uh, less profitable. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know. You, you're kind of making my life heavy because I've got some eggs in the hardware basket. No, no. <laughs> Look, okay. uh, I, I'm just saying in general and thinking about the investor's perspective. Now, if you can leap past those natural, I suppose, uh, opinions of people like me with regard to software versus hardware, then that does not mean uh, a, a very good uh, hardware uh, startup uh, with a, a large addressable market with a very good product uh that's made some advances can't attract capital uh from uh venture capitalists angel investors uh, uh high network individuals they can and they can be extremely successful i'm just saying if we had a hundred uh in the room and 50 were software startups and 50 were hardware startups uh i think uh, the probability of the distribution of the funds wouldn't be 50 50. yeah i i'm not too obsessed with the actual you know technical realities but i but i think it's enough to say that's the perception right so if you that's the, you come in yeah. and say i'm a hardware guy you get you get a different response to coming in and saying i'm a software guy yeah yeah uh, look i would say in general and i've heard it on numerous occasions hardware is hard harder and uh, I think it is, I think it is. Uh, and, but that's not to say it's not impossible. I mean, there's been some great examples of hardware companies uh, here in uh, Queensland and across Australia that have been very successful in globally as well. Yeah. I'm just saying it's harder. So, not so impossible. This, kind of, this kind of leads me to what, what would be the best way for a hardware company or a robotics company to reach out to you, you're interested to have a chat. What, what would you want to hear first? Well, in general, uh, it, it's the same thing I want to hear from a software company. Uh, what's the problem? Uh, 
how big is it? Uh, are customers willing to pay for it? Uh, and tell me why your product uh, solves that problem at least uh, twice as good, if not three times as good as uh, the alternatives. Yeah. And, uh, you know, especially in the case of hardware, uh, what is so different about your product that solves the problem at twice the speed or half the cost of what exists in the market at, at present? And if we can understand that, you know, problem, solution fit, uh, significant uh, competitive advantage, uh, uh, then you've attracted my attention to talk about a hardware product. Yeah. So I, I absolutely love that answer, Brian, because you're reinforcing what you said before. No, nowhere in there. You said thesis on the solution. You said, what is this? What would using the solution actually give me? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and when I say give me using the solution, is from the customer's perspective and that it has to be, if, if we take a, a simple example, uh, time and money and quality are the three kind of axes on this triangle. Uh, does, it, does it have the price of solving the problem? Maybe. Uh, does it do it twice as fast? Or does it solve the problem twice as good as alternatives and uh, you know in any when we look at any business especially from a project perspective we're looking at time cost and quality mm. and so when i look at a product and this is the same thing i apply to hardware software services will this either have the time have the cost or uh multiply uh, the, the quality of the outcome. Yeah, I think that's well said. Okay, I've got a, a couple of just quick wrap up questions. Um, you've kind of already answered at least half of all of them, but I'll give you the, the headlines in case you want to add a little bit. So <clears throat> is, is hard investing in hardware a challenge? And if so, what do you think about this classic um, these days don't invest in the hardware? So, so I'll probably rephrase it. Uh, you, you see, uh, uh, and I know we're, we, we spent a lot of time differentiating between hardware and software, but I actually don't think, think like that. Uh, I, look at, I look at ideas that people bring me. I look at the problem they're trying to solve. I apply the same questions to a software company as I do to a hardware company. And if they can, I suppose, jump over those initial hurdles, uh, I'm always interested to have a chat. And, and like I said, uh, it's not that I don't, I don't have a, an investment thesis that I do not invest in uh, hardware. Matter of fact, I do have an investment thesis. I don't invest in service businesses. Uh, so, you know, there, there's a, we're kind of concentrating is, is, is hardware as good as software, but uh, the businesses I don't invest in are, are purely service businesses where for every incremental increase in outcomes for a customer, you have to double the amount of staff. Yeah. So I don't invest in services businesses is my thesis. I don't have a thesis that I don't invest in hardware businesses. So uh, if that's a positive that we can take away from this conversation, that's probably a good thing. I, I think it really is. And I really want to jump in there and just echo it, maybe grab people by the ears and scream it because it's a very common thing that I hear from a lot, a lot of VCs, yourself included. It's not that you won't invest in hardware. It's not that you even think about hardware versus software. No. It's more that it needs to be presented in a way that makes it clear that there's value to customers. There's actually a business in it. There's a business and uh, ultimately that if we support that business in its early stage and its risky stage and it comes to fruition, then there's a, both the entrepreneur and the, the investors who support that risk taking are, are rewarded at some stage. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I don't, if I got a, had a chat with an entrepreneur uh, or 
saw a 10 minute pitch from an entrepreneur. I, I'm not thinking hardware versus software. I'm thinking the uniqueness of the business and the, uh, the fact that, you know, uh, I talked about scalability as a, a problem for hardware and, and it is, yeah. but there are other factors that impinge on a business's success. And if they have so, a number of unique technologies that really stands out that, uh, solves the problem way better than any in the market, uh, you know, it can be extremely successful. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, there's a, there's a YouTube uh, video from, uh, I think 1981 where Steve jobs is being interviewed on uh, the personal computer. So if you Google Steve jobs, YouTube, personal computer, uh, he uh, he talks. He's been interviewed on uh, Apple's launch of the the PC at a time when most organisations, even uh, you know, in the office, you didn't have a PC on your desk. Mm. Uh, the laptop hadn't been invented. And he outlined his vision for uh, uh, the product, and he didn't see it as a home computer. He didn't call it a home computer because if some of your listeners are uh, maybe on, on the, the older scale, uh, they'd remember a time when uh, uh, those computers were called home computers. And so he called it a personal computer. And uh, he had this vision that it would get smaller and smaller and smaller and more utilitarian with uh, more software being added. And eventually, uh, at the end of the interview, uh, uh, he envisaged a future where everyone would have a personal computer. Uh, but that wasn't his, uh, I suppose, uh, initial hypothesis. Uh, it was a, a very small market that over time would expand. Okay. I suppose he had the vision to see what that market looked like and what it could do, uh, but also realize that it, it would take time. I think it's probably Apple's probably a cute example, right? Because every time someone says to me that people don't like investing in the hardware companies, I say yeah. Apple's a hardware company. Look, uh, I mean, you could, uh, uh, one of my favorites at the moment is NVIDIA. So, uh, there you go. That's a good example. Uh, you know, and you look at its performance over the last few years. Uh, uh, e excellent Tesla, uh, you know, so, uh, when they succeed, they can really succeed. I'm just saying there are fewer of them that can succeed. I, I think it's, Classic. Um, why, why does the VCs act like finance guys are only interested in return on investment? Because, because the VCs are financial guys. Interested in return on investment. <laughs> yeah. So, I don't, I don't think there's anything that wrong with it, right? D different people, uh, different disciplines, different focus. It kind of makes sense. Yeah, but uh, I mean, look, we're not, uh, we're not the government. Uh, seeding innovation. Uh, we're not the government uh, trying to create jobs. We're investors seeking uh, a return on investment and along the way uh, in uh, seeking that out, we're looking to support and grow great businesses. Uh, uh, if they're innovative and differentiated and they employ lots and lots of people. That's fantastic. And, you know, today's announcement about Afterpay uh, being acquired by Square for 39 billion is a is a good example. That company started in 2015. So, mm. you know, up. six years later, uh, 39 billion dollars worth of value has been created for founders, investors, and shareholders. Mm. Okay, very last one. Um, friendly advice, please. How can we, the community, make Australian robotics more investable? Uh, act like an entrepreneur, not like an inventor. Okay. Very, very neat, very tidy. I like it. Uh, and I think most of your readers will understand, you know, if you come talk to me just about how good your product is, uh, I'm going to tune out. Uh, talk to me about how good your business can become. Yeah. Very good point. I think we'll leave it at that, Brian. Thank you very much for your time, mate. I appreciate it. Not a problem at all.